Hello? Are you there? Dear church, when did you trade your daily bread for daily news? Pockets feel tight when it's time to count the cost, but your pay-per-view. Speak up for your stance on politics, but speak on Jesus and all of a sudden you scared of joblessness. Conservative versus liberal, a house divided. The bride of Christ looks more like she's the bride of Trump or Biden. Senselessly living as if we don't smell death's aroma. It seems like you lost your taste for grace way before Corona. The bride that always needs more, you sing, all I need is you, Lord. Plus a spouse, plus a house, plus a large bank account. I know all you need is Jesus, but seems you want him to play a role in the film you play the lead in. They say, only God can judge me, and that he will. Which is why Christ paid the price with every lash and nail, resurrected from the tomb, and because of that, we will. They might take your body, but body, listen, your soul will not be killed. Prisoners to comfort, slaves to sin, locked in cells, adopted by the one that we sought to kill. Now, how we live is a reflection if we think this is false or real. It's real. 28. All right, if you got a Bible, go ahead and grab it. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter two. I would encourage you guys to grab a physical copy of scripture this morning. That will eliminate distractions for you guys from your phones or tablets. So you can get a hard copy of scripture in the seat backs around you. 1 Thessalonians chapter two. You can also, I was talking to Trill this morning, one of our elders, and we were just talking about uh, the importance of maybe powering down devices for the next 40 minutes or so. And so if, if you're not too freaked out by that, uh, you could do that and it would help you and those around you to be able to focus because there's always a phone going off. And this morning more than any other, it's gonna be awkward when your phone goes off because I said something about it, all right? <laughs> so uh, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter two. When I was in seventh grade, my life literally revolved around one thing and that was the sport of basketball. I was out every single day, lacing up the sneakers, pounding the blacktop, working on drills, working on layups, working on shooting, working on passing off the side of the house, like always consumed with basketball, morning, noon, and nights, thinking about the sports. I went into my seventh grade year at Maranatha Christian Academy, hoping to land the starting gig as the point guard on the junior varsity team. And while I had worked on a lot of these different skills, I had some noticeable deficits. One, was that I didn't have enough skill, quite frankly. Uh, another was that I had these fallen arches, flat feet. Some of you have that, you know what it's like, but mine were quite severe to the point that when I would run and when I would jump, the tendons would pull. It was quite uncomfortable, slowed me down. And so my mom, always empathetic, took me to uh, the foot doctor and they made, I guess this is before the days of Dr. Scholes, because they made me some of these it was like $400, which back in the 90s might as well have been 40000 today. But um, they, they made me these uh, fiberglass overlaid with leather inserts for my shoes. You couldn't see them. They went inside. My arches rested upon them. But right away, everything felt different. Perhaps it was psychological. I don't know. But everything felt different. It felt like I could move with more fluidity, that I could jump with more ease. And almost instantly, my coach... And my teammates noticed the difference. As a matter of fact, my first game back, I remember it well, my first game back after getting the inserts, I went off. I blazed the nets for nine total points, okay? <laughs> Which was a lot for JV. If you ever watch JV basketball, it's like 17 to eight final score. And so, and so <laughs> I, I'm, just, I, I'm just consuming this. I'm so excited. And my coach, my teammates are like, hey, what happened? Like, you look like a different player. And, and I told them, they, they, they could tell, I think it's important for us to notice because this is, uh, true of so many things in our lives, but they could not see the inserts themselves, the support that I had received, but they saw the manifestation, the results of that support. It was undeniable. And we've been here in 1 Thessalonians for almost a month. It's a letter of thanks and commendation from the Apostle Paul to a very faithful church, the church at Thessalonica. And Paul is thankful for their love for Christ that they have demonstrated, they have shown for their reputation for the gospel and the kingdom that's spreading across the Mediterranean world. The, the activity 
the functionality, their behavior, their conduct for Christ, their proclamation of his gospel is evidence, external evidence that they are supported well. They have a healthy foundation. And that healthy foundation is no surprise here. If you've been in Christianity for any length of time, you know this. But the healthy foundation that undergirds the robust follower of Jesus are prayer and sacred scripture. When, when these are present, when we are people of prayer and we are immersed in scripture, historically, what we have seen is there is a manifestation, not perfection as we always say, but there is a manifestation of faithfulness while the world around us, while the church within cannot see that support. They don't see your private prayer life. They don't see your devotion to the word of God, but they will always see the manifestation of a life undergirded with prayer and biblical support. Which begs the question today, if we're just honest and frank, if the world is not seeing faithfulness from us, if they're labeling us justly so, inconsistent or hypocritical. I would argue that it must be true that these supportive truths of prayer and scripture are absent from our lives. And so we ask ourselves this morning, not are we prepared to learn, because some of us will learn, but some of us are just going to be reminded of what we already know. But Rather, the prominent question for us today is, am I submitting myself to the truth that I've already taken in? There's no one here who claims faith in Jesus. I don't think, could be wrong, no one here who would say, you know what, I didn't know that I should be praying. You know what, I didn't know that I should be reading the Bible. I know that's, that's lost in our day, but still, especially if you've been coming to Building 28, hey, I, we should be people of prayer. We should be people of the word. Paul has already established the importance of prayers. He does in all of his epistles in chapter one, when he says night and day, he is praying unceasingly for them, concerning them, giving thanks to God for them. And now you come to chapter two, and we're gonna pick up right where we left off last week. And we see this second supportive element of truth for our lives. And may this word be convicting today if we are not people of the book. And if you are, if you devoted yourself to the word, not just as a means of winning an argument or bolstering your intellect, but if you committed yourself to the word because this is the revelation of God in truth, then may we be encouraged to continue on in that pursuit. We read through and explored 2, 1 through 12 last week. So we come to verse 13 this week and Paul writes this to the church of Thessalonica. And we also thank God constantly for this that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. So every November, it's typical in our family that we travel up to Northern Alabama for Thanksgiving. And we spend the week leading up to and Thanksgiving Day with my family. And it's always an enjoyable time. The pace of life is just slower in Northern Alabama. Like everything just seems to like slow down. And so we enjoy just relax and we enjoy hanging out with the family and Thanksgiving Day rolls around. My mom prepares a big breakfast for all of us. My mom, sweet, godly Southern lady who cooks everything in sugar, and butter and grease. And so uh, you just sit down, you consume this together on Thanksgiving morning. And then around three o'clock, it's time for the, the lunch slash dinner. And she'll call everyone to the table and we all kind of float upstairs and we sit around the table and all the piping hot food is on the table. And up until about two or three years ago, she would always say, all right, now before we can eat, we all need to go around and say what we're grateful for. And we used to have six people in our family, and now we have 17. And about three years ago, me and Nate were like, hey, why don't we give thanks while we're eating? 
because it's hard to be grateful with cold food, right? And so, uh, and so we kind of go around the table and no one really likes, especially if you're a rebel like myself, no one likes forced gratitude. We're like, hey, say thanks. But around the table, um, because, probably because it's kind of forced gratitude, we always kind of give thanks for these temporal things, health and our families and our homes and jobs. And, and I don't want to guilt anybody this morning. There's nothing wrong with giving thanks. As a matter of fact, we should give thanks for these temporal gifts of God to us. But what we see from Paul here, the example from Paul is something that we should all learn from. That while Paul no doubt is grateful that he escaped Thessalonica alive, that he was released from the Philippian prison, that he's grateful for Silas and Timothy, he's grateful for health, he's grateful for sustenance, he's, he's grateful for provision, he's grateful for the sea breeze coming off the Mediterranean there in Corinth as he sits there and he writes the letter to the Thessalonians. You know, he's grateful for the influence that God has through him. But Paul, more than anything else, lays out for the church, for fellow believers, that he's grateful for the effect of the truth, of the word in their lives. And if we're kingdom-oriented people, we can't deny that that should be the prominent theme of gratitude stemming from our lives. Because when the word takes effect in someone's heart and soul, it changes everything. Everything's reoriented. And so Paul here says, he begins verse 13 by saying, we also thank God, that's Paul, Silas, and Timothy, his comrades, we also thank God constantly, constantly on our minds, constantly in our mouths, we thank God for this. And then there's six observations that we see about the scriptures here in this text. I just want to either inform or remind you of this morning. Number one, he is grateful for the word declared. The word declared. When I was a youth pastor in Dunedin, I had grown up with a basketball in my hand, obviously. I've already told you that. I had never, ever been paintballing before. And some of my teenagers thought that would be a good idea. So they kept begging me about a year into being a student pastor there. I decided to take them with our youth leaders down to Largo to this paintball facility. And, uh, and the day arrived and some of my students and some of my leaders, they showed up for battle. Like I showed up in gym shorts and sneakers and a t-shirt. I mean, they showed up, like they stepped out of their armored vehicles and they just uh, <laughs> head to toe, just covered, right? You're like, man, you take this seriously. Apparently it's a matter of life and death to you. And then we go inside and the instructor informs us that this is a matter of life and death right? That uh, don't, don't ever take off your mask when you're in the, the arena there because you could lose an eye. And I'm like, I don't want to lose an eye. And so, um, and so I've, I've got all my gear and they gave me this gun and it was very subpar to the guns that my, my friends had brought with them. They had like built themselves and I uh, could spray off multiple rounds in a second. And so I've got this gun and then they just kind of, they give us some instruction. They just kind of throw us out there into the field. And you're behind all these, these, uh, these foxholes and armaments and and so I'm there and I'm, I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself, you know what, this is, this is what it's going to be like. They're going to say go, they're going to blow the whistle or the, the foghorn or whatever it is. And I'm going to kind of lay back here like American Sniper for 30, 45 minutes and just kind of pick people off around the field. Well, they blow this horn and everyone just starts running and paintballs are blazing everywhere. Middle schools are getting, middle schoolers are just getting riddled. Like they're just kind of falling and screaming and crying. And I'm back there behind the cage. And I think it might've been a minute that goes by and two of my youth leaders come around either side from the other team and they just light me up. <laughs> and I am, I, I don't know what was coming out, but I'm pretty sure I was screaming and wailing and the Christian curse words, you know, all that stuff is happening there. And, I, and, and then they're like, okay, game over. The other team won. And I'm pretty competitive. So I'm like, all right, no, this is gonna be different this time. And so I, I, I didn't even fire off a shot the first round. So I'm like, I'm gonna get a shot off. And so they blow the horn again and I muster up the courage eight to 10 seconds in and I lift my head. I had found a better hiding spot. I lift my head up and I, I kid you not, less than a second after I lift my head above the barricade to look out and survey the landscape, <laughs> yellow paintball right between the eyes, across <laughs> my goggles, I'm done, right? I was a recipient of many paintballs that day unwillingly, passively, we all understand that we receive things in this life. And some of those things we receive actively. We welcome them. We take in that gift. 
But many things in this life, both physically and emotionally, psychologically and spiritually, we receive passively. Many of them we don't want. We're not willing recipients. Paul here uses the word received. He says, we constantly give thanks to God for you because you received. There's two words here in this same verse for received. We see received here in the outset and then we see accepted or received just a short while later. And they're very different Greek words. The second, which we'll get to in a second, means to take in the gift, a willing recipient, active in participation. But the first here is very passive and it doesn't focus on the recipient as much as it focuses on the one delivering the message. The, the Greek word actually here is, it contains the prefix para. We've talked about this many times before. It's where you get parable from or parachute or paramedic, someone or something that comes along beside to help. And then it has the root word logos there. So it literally means we thank God that the word came along beside through the declaration of faithful saints. The word declared, Paul gives thanks for, and we need to pause here and we need to remind ourselves, and it's critical that we remind ourselves that there would be no church at Philippi if there were not faithful, submissive believers who were willing to declare with boldness, conviction and kindness, the revelation of God. There would be no church at Thessalonica. There would be no church at Corinth. There would be no Building 28 today. You would not be here in this room were it not for the fact that someone either placed the Bible in your hands or spoke to you the word of God. All of us, I told you it's gonna be awkward. All of us, okay? All of us, we received the word of God because someone spoke the word with boldness. They declared the word in truth. And we need to hear that today. Paul says here, I am thankful, thankful to God constantly that when you receive the word, the word spoken. Second observation that we make, not only is he grateful for the word declared, but he's grateful for the word heard. And we understand, I think we understand, there's a difference between overhearing something and hearing to take in something. We better understand that because all the research says that we only take in between seven and 13% of what we hear in our lives, of what we read, of what we see, of what we observe. My little girl, Evie, she is now notorious, five years old for, I'll tell her to do something and she delays. I told her to put down the iPad. She delays. I told her to put down a book. She delays. I told her to clean her room. She delays. It's time for bed. Brush your teeth. Go potty. She delays. And when I say to her, hey, Evie, I said it's time for bed. I said it's time to put down the iPad. What she'll say to me, maybe your kid says this as well. Oh, daddy, I didn't hear you. She did. She has overheard me. She was fixated on something else. She did not hear to take in or to be changed by the mandates. And I think that we as believers are much the same. Yes, that we, we take in many things. And in particular, we take in the word. We'll read it out of duty or obligation or guilt. Maybe we'll even read it out of the lights but we're so focused on other things. We're so distracted with everything that's going on in our lives, our job, our family, our culture, our homes. We're so distracted that we don't take in to receive. And what Paul is making very clear, he uses the Greek word akouo here. We get acoustic from this. So when you think acoustic amphitheater, it's where the swell of the music fills up the surrounding area. It's overwhelming. And Paul here says, we're grateful that the word was declared and that when the word was declared, the word was heard, not just overheard, but heard to be received. And so we just pause here this morning and we ask ourselves, we should all ask ourselves, you should be asking yourself, I should be asking myself, when we gather together in home groups each week, in Bible studies, when we gather together on Thursdays and Sundays to hear the word, have we prepared our hearts to not just overhear truth, but to hear and receive truth? Paul is grateful. 
The word declared, the word heard. Number three, the word embraced. So look what he says here again. We thank God also constantly for this, that when you receive the word declared, the word of God, which you heard from us, the word heard, you accepted it. There's the word embraced, a very different word than the received that we heard earlier in the text. You embraced it by faith. You said, this is truth. I cling to it. And just so we're clear, because the remarkable power of the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, we don't just receive or embrace the word as truth once. But for all true believers, we receive and embrace the word of God again and again and again. So I've got four declarations for you guys this morning. Some fascinating stuff. And I want you to determine. You don't have to respond because that's weird. Okay, we're not that kind of church. But you can determine internally this morning what these four declarations have in common. There's two things I believe they have in common. Ready? Here we go. Declaration number one. An ostrich eye is bigger than an ostrich brain. That's for free. Okay? Number two. Canada, which is America's hat, is an Indian word meaning big village. You're welcome. Number three, <laughs> Mel Blanc, who was the voice of Bugs Bunny, this is ironic, was allergic to carrots. It's kind of crazy. Number four, the Bible is the perfectly transforming revelation of God. Now, when we hear these, these statements declared, and you ask yourself, you don't need to overthink it this morning. You ask yourself, hey, what are, these, what are a couple of things these have in common? Uh, here's what I would posit before you. Number one, what they have in common is they're all true. All four of these declarations are true. Number two, second thing they have in common is that all these truths are trivial. They don't really matter. It doesn't matter that Mel Blanc was allergic to carrots, or I guess it mattered for him or that Canada is an Indian word meaning big village, or that an ostrich eye is bigger than an ostrich brain, or that the Bible is a perfectly transforming revelation of God. It doesn't matter. Trivial. And right away, some of us are going to rise up and go, no, 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 no. The last declaration, I get, I get they're all true, but there's a difference between trivial truth and profound transforming truth. And I would just ask, I'm just asking, does your life, does my life speak to the word of God as trivial or profound. There you go. I get it that we're going to rise up in defense of the word because that's what we do as Christians. But do we actually take in, are we actually embracing, wrapping our arms, wrapping our hearts, wrapping our minds around Scripture? Paul says, I'm giving thanks for the church at Thessalonica because they didn't just hear the word so they could regurgitate the word, so they could seem really smart to their friends in home group or Bible study. Instead, they embraced the word. There you go. So there's the word declared here. He's grateful for this. We should be grateful for that. The word declared, unaltered, uncompromised, like we talked about last week. There's the word heard to be taken in. There's the word embraced. Number four, there's the word distinguished. So he makes a distinction here. There's a juxtaposition between two declarations, the word of man and in truth, the word of God. And so what I want to do this morning is just once again, remind all of us of the difference between the word of man, because everyone has an opinion today. It seems even though we might deny it, that everyone thinks they can reinvent truth. I just need to remind us, we don't manufacture truth. That's right. There's no such thing as personal truth. There's truth and there's error. Like that's, that's not a political declaration. That is just the reality of the world that we live in. There's scientific truth and there's scientific error and the experts get it wrong. They, they, they err. There's biblical truth and there's biblical error and so many of the experts there are getting it wrong. Right. They're, they're misrepresenting. And so when we talk about uh, the Lord 
and his word, his truth versus the word of man. Let's just explore a little bit there. So I've got a couple, five statements up here. The word of man versus the word of God. Statement number one, the word of man is fallible. It's fallible. I know we don't like to admit that. We all make mistakes. We all err. We all transgress. We all sin every single day. That's right. Every single day. We don't like to acknowledge that. We, were, we went to Home Depot this week. We just bought a new house. You're gonna be praying for us. And um, we're painting the house. And I know everyone's day loves white on white on white on white on white inside their homes, which is great. Thanks, Joanna Gaines, for that. Um, but everyone loves that. But, uh, but we like dark, deep, rich colors and accents. And so we're looking at this one paint and I'm like, hey, this would be good for like kind of an accent wall to lighten some stuff up. And it was a, a really beautiful silvery color on this palette. And I'm like, hey, Daniel, what do you think of this? I think this silver light gray would go really well in the dining room. And she's like, she just looks at me, which only my wife can and your wife can. And uh, she looks at me like she's concerned, but kind of in a demeaning way. And she goes, uh, <laughs> She goes, um, you, you need to get your eyes checked again. <laughs> that is most certainly blue. It's not silver. And there are two things in life I'm sure of. One is that the word of God is true. Secondly, is that that palette was silver, okay? I was like, I was like this is not blue, this is silver. And she's like, I promise you it's blue. She's like, turn it over, see what color it is. So I turn it over and it's like, it, it says some word I've never even heard of before. And so I'm like, that doesn't help me at all. And then I was about to take a picture and post it on Instagram so you guys could help me out. A little poll, right? Because that settles everything because none of us are fallible. And, uh, and Daniel's like, hey, why don't you just ask the workers here? I'm like, you know, that's a great idea. So I turn around, there's a dude and there's a lady behind the paint desk and I hold up this little swatch and I say, hey, excuse me. My wife and I are having a conversation here, very friendly. Um, <laughs> is this silver or is it, and before I can even get the word out, they both go, no, 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 it's blue. <laughs> and I'm just like, how do y'all work here and not know colors, right? Like, I mean, how does that, how does that, like we're just unwilling to admit, admit that we're wrong. Like we can be presented with facts and data and information and we still wanna contest that what we believe and what we assert is true. And at the end of the day, if we can be humble enough, even if non-Christian here, if you can be humble enough, we can look at our lives and we can admit we've made many mistakes, we've made many false claims. Like we've seen this with COVID, right? Let's just be honest on both sides, on all sides, medical community, science community, all of us who are doctors on social media, like we've gotten things wrong. We just gotten things wrong. We flip-flopped. We get so mad with politicians and they flip-flop, but we just flip-flop all the time. Like we get things wrong. What never gets anything wrong, what never makes a mistake, what never errs is the revelation of God. Amen. It's infallible for us. And so this book has come under attack generation after generation, after generation. If you're wondering this morning, you're like, how do, you, how do you know that this is verifiable? There is a sermon that we did last fall. You can check that out where we go through and we explore the claims of scripture and we point to biblically uh, the argumentation that scripture is the word of God. But we know this morning, this book is infallible. Uh, Gandhi, not a believer, in case you're wondering. Gandhi famously said this. You Christians look after a document containing enough dynamite to blow all civilization to pieces, to turn the world upside down and bring peace to a battle-torn planet. But you treat it as though it is nothing more than a piece of literature. Like this holds the answers. I know that there's a lot of fallible declarations of what holds the answers in society today. This holds the answers. That's right. If we believe it, we need to declare it. This holds the answers. So the word of God is infallible. The word of man, we err, fallible. Doesn't mean we can't learn things from people. It just means we should not form our ideologies or philosophies around human. Number two, second thing that we see in scripture is that the word of man is exhaustible. You can read, you can study. There are several books that I've read once. There are a few books I've read a couple of times. There are very few books that I've read multiple times because the, the truth in them, the wisdom behind them is just brilliant. One of those books is the Screwtape Letters. 
I love reading this from C.S. Lewis. But after reading this a dozen or more times, I feel like for the most part, not that I can't be encouraged by it, but I've kind of exhausted what I've learned from it. That can never happen with the revelation of God. It's inexhaustible because he is inexhaustible. He is infinite. And so people who have studied the book, studied an exact passage, commentators who have written on a book of the Bible for decades can still be moved and shaped and enlightened and transformed by the same text. I always kind of chuckle when we go back to a text like Romans 3, I think I've preached on it four times over the last 10 years. And people be like, you preached on this seven years ago. As if that's a crime, but also as if we can't learn something new from the inexhaustible word of God. Number three, the word of man is unreliable. It's just unreliable. We need to, we actually, for our sake of our own health this morning, we need to understand that. It's just unreliable. We're gonna get mixed information all over the place. The word of man is unreliable. So I don't know if you know this or not, but in 2005, I wrote a book and it was published in 2006. And it's totally not a big deal. And you totally should not look it up and buy it. <laughs> because it's embarrassing now. Like things have changed. 15 years later, I'm like, man, alive. I thought I knew so much when I was 25. I thought I had the world figured out. I know some of you are like, I do. But, but seriously, that's how I, and now I'm like, man, new information over the course of the last 15 years has enlightened my mind, but it's also just convinced me of how much I don't know. And there's an inordinate amount of exclamation points in the book. It was written for teenagers, okay? So, but I'm, I'm just embarrassed by this. And some of it I look at and I was really strong on things. They're just matters of preference now or personal conviction. And I'm just reminded through my own work. Hopefully you are through yours as well. That we try to be truthful. We try to be filled with integrity. And yet our word falls short. It is unreliable. And yet the word of the Lord is authoritative doesn't change. It's absolute in truth because it's from the sovereign. Number four, the word of man is insufficient. It's just insufficient. I know we're all experts on something. Some of you thank the Lord for you. You're an expert on everything. Just everything. Okay? Like, just, it doesn't matter what it is. Somebody asks something on social media and hey, we know the answer, right? But in reality, we, if we're humble enough, prudent enough, we understand our limitations. We understand that we don't have all the answers. And in particular, when it comes to eternal life and salvation, the answers to those most profound questions are not inherent to us. We derive authority to speak the truth, the soul transforming truth of God through his truth. And so this morning, we need to understand that the word of man is insufficient, but the word of the Lord is completely sufficient. It answers every question. And then number five, and this will bring us to our fifth observation as well in the verse this morning. The word of man is informational. And we're informed by it. We're informed of different truths. And, and don't get me wrong, like when we take in these truths, these rules, these principles, our, our lives can be changed when we apply them. But the word of man does not enter into transform. And that is what is so remarkable about this book. It is not merely informational, even though some of us have made it so. It is transformational. Which brings us to observation number five. So there's the word declared. He says, we give thanks because you receive the word of God. The word is heard, which you heard from us. The word is embraced. You accepted it. The word is distinguished here, not as the word of men, but as it is really the word of God. Observation number five, which is at work. The word empowered. We've already talked about it. It was up in chapter one, but this is the Greek word, energos. We get energy from this. So the word of God is Energized. 
All these books behind me that have been a backdrop for our series, they got some good information. Some of them do anyway, some of them are terrible. But none of them are alive. They're not transformative. They're not empowered. Martin Luther famously said in the the word of God, the scriptures are alive. They have feet, they run after me, they have hands, they grab hold of me. That scripture, it comes within by the power of the Holy Spirit and it revolutionizes, it transforms everything. And when we say alive, we're not talking about like my dog Penny is alive. I could have a picture for you this morning, but she wouldn't fit on one screen, okay? She is 15 years old. She looks like somebody literally um, blew her up. Like she just, she just waddles around. She's mostly blind. She's completely deaf. Sweet little dog. Love her. Doesn't know where she is half the time, but I love her. She's alive. But she is not benefiting anyone. She's not changing anything. She's just there. And perhaps that's how we see the word of God. We're like, okay, well, it says in scripture that it's quick and powerful, sharpening to edged sword. It says that it's alive for us. But what we need to understand is that that life is transformative. Right. It actually benefits the recipients of it. So the word here is empowered. He says, which is at work. This book is at work. I remember being in home group a few years ago and just sitting around and the people, a lot of new converts just talking about how spending time in the word and meditating on the word and memorizing the word had completely changed their life. It's miraculous, remarkable, and it's working. And finally, a sixth thing that we see together this morning, which you've already talked about, is it is sanctifying. So the word declared, the word heard through that declaration, the word embraced, and distinguished, not as the word of man, but as it is in truth, the word of God, the word empowered. And all of this brings about sanctification, which means basically a progression to be by the spirit of God through the truth, the word of God, more like Jesus. Why is the written logos of God, the written logic of God is the rendering the, the logos, we've talked about this before, but in the first century and preceding the first century, the Greek philosophers like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, they all talked about the logos. It's kind of this ambiguous idea of what holds the world together, what makes the universe make sense. It's the logos. And then John, John chapter one says, and the logos, the logic, what makes the world make sense, what holds everything together, the logic became flesh. Not ambiguous, became flesh and we beheld glory. The written word is transformative because it in truth, power alive testifies to the living word. It testifies to the one that we celebrate and remembered and gave thanks for in communion this morning of Christ himself who entered into the fray, into the mess and is testified of from Genesis to Revelation and went to the cross, as we explored last week in the gospel, went to the cross and stood in our place, took our sin, bore wrath and rose again in triumph. This is the living word. He lives today. And his word, his written word is alive. It moves us. On Thursday this week, I left the church. I had prepared for the sermon. I I left the church. I had to run an errand before church. And uh, so I had made the loop down here at sunset and was on my way back up toward Countryside Mall. And uh, I'm on the frontage road and there's this white truck that's veering off of US 19. And I don't know if you know, um, look, we're, we're in Florida, so you should always drive with caution. As people just drive crazy down here, okay? But, um, but sometimes you can tell that someone is not paying attention. And I could tell. I don't know if they're on their phone or you know, whatever the case might've been, but they come off the, the ramp and they get into the, the the lane that's going straight across Countryside Boulevard. And I'm in the right turning lane by Dick Sporting Goods, but I'm going slow because I just feel like something's about to go down, you know? Uh, my intuition's wrong sometimes, but I wasn't in this situation. All of a sudden, as I come up to the truck, just a couple of yards away, the truck slowly just veers right into my lane. Changed their mind. Maybe they didn't have anything in their mind in the first place, but they changed their mind. 
And so I did what we do. I served them by blowing my horn, <laughs> letting them know, hey, you almost died. If I've been paying attention, you'd be in a mess right now. So I blow my horn. I blow it for a somewhat lengthy period of time. And uh, <laughs> they speed up, they pull up to the light, they turn right on the Crunch Stop Boulevard. And I turn right and I get in the far left lane. I'm gonna turn into the mall. And they get in the far right lane by Grillsmith there. And so I'm kind of looking over at them. Like nicely, you know, <laughs> just like, just like everything all right over there, <laughs> everything all right. And they're not looking at me. You can just see them there. And then they go to turn right into the Grillsmith parking lot. And when they do, they give me the salute, <laughs> right? In that moment, I'm bothered. I don't know that person unless it was one of you. I don't know that person, <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know. You need to repent. I don't know that person though. But I'm like, what's wrong with you? Like, how do you not understand that this was your fault? Like, you pulled out, you almost caused an accident. Like, this, is, this is on you, right? Maybe I could have responded better, but this is on you. You almost caused this. And then I'm thinking to myself as I'm turning in Trenchside Mall, thinking, man, you just want to look at so many Christians and we look at internal things, not just at our husband and wife, because that's easy. At our friends, at the most immature person in your home group which is, I've always said, if you don't know who that is, it's you. Um, so, but but we, we just want to look at other people and be like, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? I know, I know, you know this morning, if you didn't know 40 minutes ago, you know now that there's one truth that will transform our, even Gandhi knows this. An unbeliever knows it will revolutionize your life. It'll bring peace to your soul. It will impact and bring societal change. It's the truth of God. And yet then we proceed through life, ignoring this, shelving this, marginalizing this. And we wonder why our children don't have any love for Jesus. And we wonder why our souls are so cold. And we wonder why nothing's changing. Nothing's happening. We have no love for God. He seems distant and removed to us. And yet the Lord in his sovereign kindness has gifted us this. And this morning by his spirit, through feeble declarations, he calls us back. We know the truth. That's right. Will we immerse ourselves in it? Will we submit ourselves to it? Or will we continue to be left with the question, what's wrong with me? Let's pray. Father, we're grateful this morning, as always, for the living word. The word become flesh who came to this battle-torn planet, to this sin-soaked world, and without sinning, transgressing your law, he lived perfectly in humble righteousness, And he went to the cross and in his perfection, all the transgression of all of your people was laid upon him. And with his wounds, we are healed. By his sacrifice, we have life. The son of God became flesh so that flesh could become sons of God. And we know all this through the power of and the life and the sufficiency of your written word. God, make us people of the book. Make us people who desire to know you, not people who say it's important, but live as though it's trivial. Make us people who love you, who desire to know you, and who understand that we know you through immersion in your word.